I like to start off something like this to tell you that uh, my introduction to electronics was a shocking experience. Uh, and it occurred when I was somewhere around four or five years old. Uh, my feet were in a mud hole and my father was handing an extension cord with a metal socket. I could not let go, but my, my mother was able to get it out of my hand. So just, just remember that in, in, in dealing with electricity. <laughs> it's not always one hand behind you, although I've had experiences with that too. And kind of looking to cover a, a broad range here, let's go back to the, kind of the very beginnings of antenna. And what are we really talking about here? Um, electromagnetic radiation. Notice two words there, electro and magnetic. Anybody remember the <clears throat> technician question about uh, polarization? Is, is it polarized by the magnetic field or is it polarized by the electric field, the common nomenclature? Which is it? The electric field or the magnetic field? I see a show of hands. Electric field. Magnetic field. Okay, you, fit, you didn't pass that question. Uh, it's always with the electric field, which is also parallel with the antenna itself, because the electrons are moving from one end to the other, so it's electric from one end to the other, positive, negative. It's an easy way to remember that one. The current that flows in an antenna creates the magnetic field. If you want to demonstrate that to your children or something, uh, it's actually very easy. Take a wire and have a battery or something and have current going through the wire and hold a magnet off to the side. You will see that there is a magnetic field that causes the compass needle to move and basically be perpendicular to where the wire is. As you move around 90 degrees, the compass needle still stays parallel to where or perpendicular to where the current's flowing. So that's just some elementary electromagnetic theory. <clears throat> My experience in this, anybody ever heard of Krauss antenna book? 70 years ago or a little bit less than that, I was in a three-quarter course with this book. I didn't learn very much from here. I learned a lot more after I graduated and had a job with practical applications of antennas. <clears throat> One of the basic fundamentals that we always need to remember when we're dealing with antennas is wavelength. Because so many of the things that we do with antennas, we need to know what the wavelength of the signal that we're trying to radiate happens to be. Does a number 300 ring a bell? 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. That gives you the length of the, the wavelength in, <clears throat> in meters. Good example. 300 divided by 146. What's that approximately? Two meters. If you want to know exactly, it's 2.0548 or about 76.79 inches, and a quarter wave, 19.2. And if you came up here and kind of looked at this driven element, it's probably going to be a little bit shorter than that, but it's going to be in that dimension. The directors are going to be shorter, the reflector is going to be longer. What's the ideal antenna? Dipole. What? Nope, it's one that does not take up any space to start. Think about it, does not take up any space. No tuning required across all the bands. Still with me? It's 100% efficient. And question mark, omnidirectional coverage. Actually, it should be a spherical coverage, which is the theoretical one that can't be produced. 
Okay. It's just that the physics will not allow that to occur with an antenna. We're in a real world and there are real physical laws that uh, control what, uh, what is taking place. If you look at just the basic antenna element itself, let's say that that antenna element is like part of my finger here. And we excite that at a resonant frequency. What's the pattern going to be? It's going to be basically a figure eight in the same plane that the antenna is in. Okay? Here would be a figure eight in this dimension. Okay? Here it'd be a figure eight in the horizontal plane. That's looking at just a portion, an elemental portion of the total antenna. It just so happens that a dipole in free space will produce roughly that same pattern. It'll be a little more stretched out each way, but that's the basic dipole pattern that comes from an element of an antenna. <clears throat> The bad part of building an antenna, everything around it influences its performance. Everything around it influences its performance as long as it's close to the Earth. Now, if it gets out in, out in the space someplace, there's probably some things around it that still influence it. But we do have what are called free, pa free space patterns, which are theoretical. And really, the only place to achieve them is going to be out there. Part of my career was spent with the Federal Aviation Administration. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with navigational aids. Okay. Go to an airport. There are two basic navigational aids that are there for landing system. Today's world, we've got GPS and other stuff, but I'm going to go back to the basic landing system. There's one piece of equipment that provides guidance left or right runway centerline. It's called a localizer. And we've also got one that's producing anywhere from two and a half to three degree glide slope, which is a descent angle. The heavy aircraft use a slightly lower. Three, three degrees used to be the standard, but I think with the heavy aircraft, they make it a little, a little less. The localizer, which is left-right signal on the runway. Power lines off to the side, trees off to the side, could produce courses that did this kind of stuff. That's not what you want when you're within a mile of the runway. <laughs> on the glide slope, you know, a lot of airports, you go off the end of the runway and there's, hmm, looks like they built this up on a riverbed or something. Well, that drop off in terrain can also cause dips in the glide slope pattern. So there, there are techniques of basically canceling out the influence of taking various antennas at the right height, of canceling that out and being able to still get a smooth glide slope. But that's just a, an example of the kinds of things that everything around an antenna. An antenna in here is not going to have the same pattern that one outside this. It will in possibly in here, but we got so much stuff going on, we'd never be able to figure it out. Ground and terrain are major influences, especially with the change of frequency, because the wavelength and its distance away from a reflector are crucial factors. Mm. On this uh, Yagi antenna, which I'll speak more about a little bit later, notice the driven element is here and it, with a gamma match. The reflector is here. Its distance, its spacing, and its length are all part of the calculations designed to get a pattern 
it has maximum strength in this direction. The same is true of these directors, which are, which are shorter. It also minimizes what might be back here. Some antennas are designed to absolutely reduce the backside to almost nothing. <clears throat> Absorption and reflection are always present. On the absorption aspect, I'd like to talk about one of the questions that used to be in the tech, tech uh, class. They changed it. <laughs> if you're operating in the 440 band, where will you get, will you get better reception on 440 or two meters inside a building? Okay. Let's see, well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, there's no windows. There's no windows. Or if there's windows, they've got screen that's made out of metal. Okay? Will you get better reception on two meters? Raise your hand. You get better reception on 440? Okay, Yay. still not quite with it. National standards for inst uh, national N -I -N -N -S -T -I -N -I -S -T, National Institute for Standards and Technology did an extensive test with a few very rare exceptions. The lower frequency penetrates the building better. Contra contrast to what Motorola has preached for the last 25 years. Okay? Their concept is based on having windows, which is signal that can go through. They removed that from the technician this last go round. Uh, reflections are always present, also. Depending on what this wall is, we could have a strong signal over this way. It could also absorb it. Okay? Multi element antennas, of which this Four element Yagi is one. And we built a lot of these at one point in time, and they're still very useful. Three element tape measure. By the way, it's cheap, and it's also very good. <clears throat> Get gain in one direction, but it's at the expense of the signal everywhere else around it. Because the purpose of the various elements, the uh, arrangement of links and the spacing of them is all intended to produce maximum signal in one direction. Directors and reflector elements change the front to back ratio. It's another way of looking at it. You take it away from one side and you send it in the other direction. Now, side-by-side -side elements, and it just so happened that the localizer antenna that the FAA uses, uses side-by-side -side elements because we're trying to produce a pattern that right down the center of the runway is zero. And the way to do that is to have two elements side-by-side, -side. they had more. Some of them had as many as 16. The standard, when I first started working, was eight. But two elements, one 180 degrees out of phase to the other. And you got a null right down the center line. Now, that, with the signals on either side, with the null in the middle, was the actual guidance signal. There was a carrier signal that was produced both ways, but the, it was out of phase with one tone and in phase with the other tone, depending on which side of the runway you were. So side-by-side -side antennas can produce uh, patterns just the way in line can. It's just a matter of how you do it. <clears throat> Height above ground unless you're way out there and in free space. But height above ground is a very important factor to consider. 
especially when you trying to shoot a signal over a mountain that's 2,000 feet higher than you are. Very true. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was the task at Vogel State Park for the Georgia Death Race. Now, fortunately, over the last, this is the fifth year, we figured out how the best way to get the signal where we, want it, where we needed it to go. It wasn't working trying to go peer to peer. So a digipeter down there near Jasper was a wonderful target. The only problem within two miles of where Vogel is, there was a mountain that was 2,000 feet above. So you got to do something to get a signal basically at the top of the mountain and use knife edge propagation to then get into it because there's nothing between that mountain and the digipeter. So height is always a factor unless you're in outer space. And it's also true of HF, long wire antennas. The higher you can get them up to practical limits, the lower the radiation is to the horizon. If you look at it in a perfect situation, a horizontal polarized antenna will have zero signal on a flat horizon. I say theoretical, because there's always exception to that theoretical. <clears throat> there's also a difference between vertical and horizontal polarization, because horizontal polarization gives you the null on the horizon. Vertical polarization tries to give you a signal on the horizon, but then you get losses in the ground also that subtract away from that. So there's a lot of things that you have to consider when you're looking for that. Uh, one of my favorite antennas that I built, and I'll go ahead and mention this now. Uh, this became very popular, or should I say in some cases, misaligned. Marvin, if you'll hold that leg. And if I could get you to just do a little on this one here. Okay. That's good. That's all I need. How simple is that for an antenna? This is the vertical part. Those two go 40, 45 degrees out. It's 10 meters. I can blow the socks off of some folks about 20 miles away from me, and I've got it such that the ends of the ground radials are only about this high off the ground. But this, instead of having four, it's only got two. The difference in the pattern, theoretically, from four to two is about one dB. It's one dB better in the direction of where the radials are. It's not worth putting up the other two. <laughs> it certainly complicates the installation, right? Yeah, this will be one of, the, one of my favorites. And the guy that came up with this concept, David Stanley, he... W5-4L. W5-4L. He, he kind of nicknamed it the tripole. Well, first I've seen that. huh? That's the first I've seen that. It is great on 10 meters. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, the size is great for 10 meters, but you could do the same thing with anything else. Is it's just a. One to one that's not even a balance. It isn't. No. The ground radials go to the shield on the cable, the other one is a center feed. Well, you can play with the uh, lengths of it a little bit to get it narrowed in on exactly what part of 10 meters you want. And we're, we're gonna, let's talk about ground influence. The theoretical impedance of a half-wave dipole, theoretical, is 72 ohms. However, 
its relationship with ground, guess what? It comes out to nice 50 ohm. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's, that's one of those little unknown facts about why we can, everybody talks about 50 ohms. But a theoretical half wave dipole on frequency is 72 ohms. I saw some head shaking. You agree with me? <laughs> What? I would like to see that work. Oh, it works bad. I bet. <laughs> it, uh, it's kind of amazing. And yeah, you do get a little bit of SWR change depending on... And I, like I said, I usually have the ends down to about here on each side. Because I'm really just trying to blow the socks off somebody over in Eton. I mean, is it going to work? Yeah, we know but. who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Because when he goes horizontal, I can't hear it. But if he goes vertical, I can knock the socks off of it. Which one of these times? There's three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enough, enough. I like to have a little fun with these because I think you learn more when you, when you do that. Okay. One of the things that I enjoy doing is antenna modeling. Um, there's some free programs that are out there, but unless you've got one that uses NEC, I think NEC4 or something like that, it really doesn't have the flexibility. And I ran into antenna modeling, uh, again, working with the FAA. The FAA had a contract with uh, Ohio University. They had a renowned uh, avionics, aircraft electrical systems department there. And, of course, this is when the program that I run probably was running on a mainframe. Uh, there is a, a modeling program that is, you can put together your own antenna by defining the elements in segments, etc. It's called EasyNIC. I've got EasyNIC 4 Plus, which allows me to make, put in more elements. It has now been upgraded to EasyNIC 6, and I'm hoping I get a good discount to get an update for it. But uh, I did modeling on these antennas here, including the loop loading that's here. You can put those, you can put those kind of parameters into the model, and it, that's, that's how I know that the circularity of that antenna is less than one degree, about one degree variation going around it, stronger in the direction of where the radials are. But who's going to worry about plus or minus one, one dB? <laughs> okay. Antenna modeling, the Easy NIC 6 is the one that I'd recommend, and I'm, think it's, I'm thinking it's going to go for probably about $150, but you can put in up to 2,000 discrete elements, and I might, this might be 10 elements of those 2,000, because you're trying to break it down into small chunks as you put it in. But you can define this antenna. I'm not sure I can put the gamma match in, but... That's a, that's a different. But anything that's just straight uh, can be modeled. But I became acquainted with what modeling could do, uh, again, when I was working for the FAA, where Ohio University had the avionics department. And what they were doing, we would have a problem with a landing system. They would then model it. And Atlanta Airport, back in the... 60s, 70s, they added a new runway, had power lines along one side of it, the localizer signal was going like this. They came up with a solution. You need to put another wire spaced a certain distance away from the power line to essentially cancel out the reflection that was coming back and disturbing the signal. Yeah. 
it, it, no, it's just it's just up there. But I don't know I don't know what the what the details were, but it's space at a, a specific distance from the closest power line. Well, sure, it's just working just like a reflector, then, right? Well, but you get a conductor here and a conductor here, and if you get these two out of phase with each other in the reverse direction, they cancel out. Okay. So it was. That was a recommendation. Power company. String up another wire, parallel, certain distance away from it. Problem went away. So it's it's some of the things like that that really intrigued uh, intrigued me with with some of the stuff with the antennas. So it's been a topic that uh, that I've enjoyed for quite a while. Uh, Let's move on to what I call some of my favorite antennas. Everybody, how many, everybody recognize this? It's an Arrow 2 meter 440J pole. This is always my recommendation for a new technician that wants to put an antenna up outside his house. Or if he doesn't have a tin roof, metal roof, he can put it in his attic. I always do it. it. Used to be $39.95. I think now it's gone up to about $45 or maybe a little more. But I still recommend it. It's solid made, etc. And this is what I used in September for the uh, Sorba bike race. Not September. That's February. February March. Sorba bike race up on top of Johns Mountain because we were needed basically, myself and a partner, we were net control up on Johns Mountain for a two meter and a 440 uh, communications channel. So with a radio that does both bands, we also had a separate band where we were monitoring a MERS frequency. I think that one may have been the one on top of the cab of my truck. But, <laughs> 2 meter 440, and I have yet to find anybody that says it doesn't have good SWR within the 2 meter and 440 band. 440 band gets a little bit squirrely on one end, but it's, it's a good antenna. Uh, basically what I have right here is what we had set up as our primary antenna up on top of Johns Mountain. This is courtesy of Calhoun Hamfest last year. I say courtesy, I bought it there. Somebody else bought three of them. It's just that he had more money than I <laughs> had I did. Because I was look, I'd look, if this guy's saying, if he's back this year and he's got another one, I'm going to get another one from him. But two meter more, 440, and it's just, just stick it in there, and that's enough for it to, do what needs to do. Okay. Coax, right there. Oh, okay. I see. That's right. I've got, I used to have one. I forgot where it was. <laughs> it's a great antenna. It is. It's good. Yes. That's what I have in my house, and I have not noticed any effects unless it gets wet. I do notice some differences when it's wet. But then again, if my roof is wet, then the leaves on the hill that I'm trying to get over are also wet. And I don't know how they are influencing <laughs> what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Mar Marvin, we all, if it wasn't for a few trees between us, we, we can see each other's house. I have not noticed I have not noticed that as an issue. I can hit that before NWG-15 down on Oglethorpe Mountain sometimes from my house on 10 watts. At other times I have trouble at 50. Huh. And I think as much as anything it's probably the vegetation and moisture on the leaves or whatever on the hill, and I've got two hills that I'm going over. So it's not a nice clean edge 
knife edge like I've got over at Vogel when I'm doing the operation from there. We did it on five watts at Vogel as a test on Friday before the race began s Saturday. Not with this antenna, with this antenna. And of course this has about nine dB more gain. No, this has only got about six and a half more gain because that is a full full wave, full, full, or a full half wave radiator above the top of the 440 portion. And of course it's the highest part of it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I've talked, we've talked about the 10 meter antenna there. Uh, 10 meter vertical in tree, it's simple, it works, and it's easy to, if you cut it a little bit long, it's very easy to walk it into where you want it on 10 meters at a given height. And remember, if your height changes, it could change things a little bit. This has been, this has been my longtime favorite, this 2 meter 440, because when I first op started operating, <coughs> All I had for a long time was an HT. It was a two meter. But I knew eventually I'd go to the 440 and I'd, I got one of these from Universal Radio. Anybody ever done any business with those folks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've, and this is actually probably as far as two meter goes, probably my favorite because it's solid elements. It's got a feed arrangement with this gamma that will allow me to really tune it to where um, it's dead on whatever frequency I want it to be on. Does anybody know how a gamma antenna match works? The distance from here influences whether or not you're at 50 ohms, 52 ohms, 55 ohms, etc. Because as you go further out, the resistance portion will change. Out here it's very, very, very high. <laughs> the capacitor in here, you know, there's a piece of metal in there. It's almost like a piece of coax in there. This distance with this here is a capacitor. So if there's any uh, X value, you can tune that out also. So with the playing around with this, you can make it match exactly where you want it on. However, if I get an antenna within about 1.5, I don't necessarily go any further than that. Because the amount of loss that a 1.5 to 1 SWR ain't worth messing with. Yeah. So if you hadn't heard that before, <laughs> I'm saying that right now. <laughs> It just ain't worth messing with. <laughs> yeah. And that's at a given height, too. Okay. Per design frequency. <clears throat> and that's going to depend. Now, there was a point in time a few years ago where we built a whole bunch of these. As a matter of fact, I think we built a bunch of them at a um, ham fest probably about four or five years ago. It's a very good, let's get back to what it really looks like. Yeah. Somebody says, oh, does that affect the radiation over here? Possibly a little bit, but the uh, plastic, polyure, poly whatever, I think that has minimal effect on the overall. If it does affect it, it probably has to do with the length and you can always snip them off if you need to do something. But here, this one with this uh, inductive match across here is uh, key. But this one is, it's lightweight um, and you can insert this one into a pole or whatever. Probably have to have a stop, but it's been a while. Usually if I want, sometimes I'll just simply put a coupling on here to whatever to go, to go down. 
but we built we built a bunch of these and uh, it's it's still one of my favorite although most of what I do it does not have quite the gain that this one does but still very good okay questions That's that's that is an RF choke. Okay, air choke. And if you look up tape measure antennas, you'll find this very design. So, if you look on the internet for tape measure antenna, you'll find this. One of the things that I do, which is a little bit different, you notice screws holding the reflector and the director in place. Yet I've got cl uh, clamps up here. It makes for easier tuning. Rather than snip, because if you snip and you snip too much, because the effective distance is from wherever these tips are. Okay? Within reason. You obviously can't have a. Yeah, but they don't stay. I don't know. I don't know. That'd be, in, that'd be interesting. What would happen if we put it. What would happen if we, nope, couldn't do that because this spacing wouldn't be a good enough for 440, wouldn't be appropriate for 440. Good thought. <laughs> what is the, uh, well, I'm talking uh, about for tuning. Uh, instead of snipping, you can bend it, see where you are, you can always uh, rivet it in. Because yeah. Uh, because it's still uh, physically a wire. And that's the reason these were, these were, it was just a way of facilitating the tuning a little bit, being able to do that. Uh, at this point, I could probably put the screws in there and take the clamps off. Okay. What the average cost of an antenna like that to assemble the part? This? Mm -hmm. The hardware costs more than the <laughs> Yep. Because these clamps are not cheap. Uh, depends on whether or not you've got it, you have to go out and buy a new. Uh, <laughs> a new tape measure to, get, to be able to get it. And, and, and there is a little bit of cost in PVC, especially the T's and the cross, and less than $10, I'm sure. Okay, that, as far as um, presenting, is basically, I think, let me check, Where's my paper? I think that's what I had planned to cover in that regard. Ah, one, one other. I do have an HF antenna. Other than the 10 meter, I only have one other HF antenna. It's a W5GI mystery antenna. A lot of people look at it and they'll say, oh, it's a G5RV. Its overall length is almost the same. It is fed by twin lead, same way as it, G5 RV, the G5RV. One difference. There's a quarter wave element at the end, which is wire. There's a quarter wave element in the middle that is coax. And then there's a quarter wave that connects to the center that's a quarter wave. That coax kind of does a funny thing. And, and I have not been able to model it because of the so-called phase change as a result of the coax and the way that it goes through. The, the shield and the conductor are not soldered where it goes into the coax, but on the output end, it is. There is supposedly a phase reversal for that middle section on each side that puts it in phase. Whereas if you put up, and this is for 20 meters, if you put up a half wave dipole at 20 meters, it's just a straight 20 meter you know, antenna. So it's actually functioning like a three half wavelength antenna on 20 meters. But it does load at 40, actually it does quite well at 40. Um, and it will also operate on 7580. It won't work on 10. 
the SWR is so high, <laughs> even my LDG tuner won't take care of it. Um, 15, I'm not sure. I'm never really. Yeah, but once you, when you get onto the twin lead, because the twin lead is a part of that tuning, I've never really been on 15 with it, but I, I kind of tend to agree with you. But why try to go 10 meters on it when I've got something that's a whole lot better? <laughs> All right. Anybody familiar with the, w, the W5GI mystery antenna? Take a look at it. It's an interesting, it's an interesting, and it does use twin lead just like the G5RV does. So, all right. I don't know. If you like a lot of heavy reading, I do recommend their book. This one's a couple of years old. I'm not sure where we're, what we're up to now. <laughs> Cover. Oh, and by the way, if you get this, you will also get a version of Easy Nick. I think they, they're still continuing to do that. But it will only work with the programs that are on the disk. Okay. I don't think you can build your own models. I think, I think you, but that's one way of playing with Easy Nick and the programs that come on the disk with it is to, uh, if you get one of these, I think this is not only got the Easy Nick, but it's also electronic version of this. That's the reason I don't buy one every year. That's the reason I don't buy one every year. Yeah. Okay? Plus $30 shipping. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till your birthday and you can get free shipping? Is yeah. that what? Well, 10% off anyway. <laughs> that wouldn't cover shipping. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I had planned to talk about. I am open to any, any kinds of questions that you may come up with. Uh, if I don't have the correct answer, I'll try to dazzle you with it something. <laughs> but I've, I've, enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed antennas from the standpoint it was part of, important part of my career with practical applications that I only became fully aware of later on. Um, I'm relatively new as a ham. I've only been a ham 12, 13 years. But I had the desire when I was a teenager because of a neighbor of mine had a short wave. He was an SWL. He listened to short wave. But I missed a lot of fun. So, I got any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, your uh, mystery antenna. Yeah. Is it flat top? I use it as an inverted V. Uh, the top of it is at about 25, 26 feet, something like that. And the end elements come down to about here. It's a rare, rare day that I cannot check into the Sunday net with Charles. And I used to participate in a net at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's called the Treasure Coasters on 40 meters. And it was very interesting. I learned as much about long distance propagation from the year plus that I was participated in any early in the morning I couldn't talk to people northwest corner of Tennessee but I could talk to Maine South Florida and then you could see the band change as the sun came up it was a, it was a great experience but but it, it's an inverted V relatively low and I and I purposely did that not only because that's as tall as the piece of mass that I've got but it's also to basically cover basically our 300 mile, what I'd call 300 mile circle. <laughs> Did, uh, I have a question. During the field day, we don't have a lot of height around here on the trees, and I'll sometimes put G5 RV. The ladder line's not always in the, all the way in the air. How do you think that affects the performance? Q 
keep it that far off the ground? Only if the only if it's probably if it's two times the width of the ladder line away from the ground, it's probably not going to have influence because most of what's taking place is between the two conductors. So not laying on the ground. Laying on the ground would not be good. But if you can get it up like that, I don't think it's a I don't think it changes anything. Because all the signal is is between those two those two conductors that are part of it. Have you heard of the uh, Cobra Elite? Okay, I know what the Cobra is. That's the one that goes zigzag back and forth. Charles uses a Cobra. He has fantastic coverage, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, Cobra Elite that I, is what I use. And uh, I, I run ladder line, 450 on ladder line. And uh, I got it. I had it at about 25 feet, but I put it, I, I did some work on my little push pole and uh, got it up at 40 feet. And I was. What was your experience in the change? Uh, you change frequency, you have to I, I got uh, a lot better match with it, but I also, like, I have a metal pole that I, that, that my fiberglass pole is. I kind of put two of them together yeah. to make it stronger. And uh, I got the, because I had it originally with the ladder line straight down and then over to the house and over. It was about this high off the ground. But now I ran it this way. And when I did that, away from everything, it made a big difference. Probably be more stable than being close to the yeah. ground. I noticed that it seemed like I, I got around more local with it lower, but up higher. I always like, you know, getting out further. Well, that ladder line is part of the antenna. And yeah. if you short, you know, if you change it, you're, you're really affecting a lot of things you have to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. I you're pretty dressed up, you are miserable. You, well, I said I'll put a lot of bar in your shack. <laughs> do you uh, believe that a lot of guys are saying you get more power out on the wire with uh, with the uh, antenna lines when you use 450 ohm ladder line compared to coax. And I know where they're coming from on that because in theory the ladder line has got lower loss. Right. But it all depends on the ladder line out at the antenna is also trying to match a load. Is it a 450 ohm ladder line? or right. Okay. It's, that 450 is trying to match what it hopes it's looking for is, an, is another 450. Right. Okay? You'd ha I'd have to, have to do a little more thinking with some more details, but ladder line generally will be lower loss, same length, a lot less than coax will. Yeah, right. It will. Yeah. You're actually, you're actually getting a signal on the ladder line where the two conductors are acting as one. Mm -hmm. Never heard about that, but I, I, under, I understand it. Well, it's not just that. It, you're, you know, well, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, theory that what it's uh, made by, um, I'd have to look it up, but basically it's, it's three wires inside of uh, insulated tape for the uh, elements. And it goes kind of like this. Okay. Is, 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 each, is each one of those... Well, that's where it gets its name Cobra. It has that S-shaped right. snake. Right, right, right. And that's why they name it yeah. Cobra. It has nothing to do with the CD product. No. It, it, in some ways, I think the Cobra also function as a top hat type antenna. That's interesting. Okay. Because... Those elements are so close together, they're not radiating as an individual element. So in some ways, it, to me, like, it's, got a, it's a double top hat. And the vertical, whatever is doing there, <laughs> may be where the... LBG tuner, you, you probably thought you had to use a capacitance button on it more to, to 
Yeah. I have not explored the Cobra, I, and I know Charles uses one, and uh, he... he I've, you have to change. Well, I have it hooked to my 41,000 my, um, go, go in my tuner, and uh, it does a marvelous do, job. Does it... Does it... Do you have an antenna tuner? Yeah. Where is it located? At the radio itself? Yeah. Okay. And uh, come in through the window, and then... It's about 10 feet left. They said you could tune it, but uh, if you can, it's an 81 foot length, and uh, both lengths are 70 feet out in a center fed dipole. Using a balance? Yeah. Okay. One to four? Yeah. Or four to one. Four to one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah That's what he uses. I could show you. You had on a metal pole? Well, the metal pole. Well, I made the uh, four fiberglass one because my I brought the uh, it's, MFJ one. It's to, to strengthen his. And it uh, goes whoop like this. <laughs> so halfway up, I, I I bolted it here or tied it here and here. So really now that other part of the fiberglass pole is a lot stronger, but still I had to take the wires and blow back, pull them this way because it was still going. Oh. Okay. It won't hold the bug master. G5 antennas are very, very susceptible to gutters, metal roofs, yeah. all that left. Yeah. I wonder if that's an issue there too. Yeah, I, the, the W5GI that I have, I pull the uh, coax basically away from it, mm -hmm. uh, from, from the top. Oh. Because, because as you get within that, clo that kind of a distance from the metal, it really messes up the operation of the twin lead. So, okay. Any others? Go ahead. I see you've got that JSO mounted on PVC. Would it make any difference if it was mounted on a metal mast? I don't think so. Uh, because everything from a radiation standpoint, one of the things I usually try to do is I come down about 19 inches and I put some uh, ferrite cores. That's a way of isolating from here down. And it, there may be some function of this much of the coax that's a part of the radiating system. But I usually try to, one of the suggestions is to put a coil within a certain distance of a certain diameter away from that, especially for the 440 section. But I simply put a, what would be a quarter wavelength down the coax, put a couple of ferrite uh, chokes on there. That's, that's my general practice. Got, that way, that quarter wave is part, if there is anything coming off, it then gets either absorbed or reflected back up. Be like another radio, wouldn't it? But it doesn't need it because it's using, this, this, is, the, this is a little bit different than most, if, if you look at the, usual way of making the J-pole. This is the parasitic element and it's fed over here. This one is actually fed here. And this becomes a parasitic radiator is probably the best way to describe it. Of course, <clears throat> but this one is feeding it from here, but it's but it's most of the radiation is going to come off from from there up. Okay, that's just like this one is fed, and this is going to be the 440 radiator, and this is the the J part of it, the bottom of the loop for the J. This is a, this, I've never seen this, this, this design of a, um, a J-pole any place else. But it does work. <laughs> and I like, I like the solid aluminum. And every part on there is replaceable from arrow. They also make one that has a joint at this point and I think at this point. So it can be broken down into smaller 
smaller elements. What is the gain ratio on that one? Hmm? What is the gain ratio? It is probably something in the order of 2 dB. See, this, this is roughly a quarter wave, and this is a full half wave, which theoretically has a 2.17 dB gain over the theoretical isotropic. So that's on two dB. But this, but this is a full dipole. And, and the gain does go up on uh, 440. I, I don't recall the number on 440. I was going in uh, Arizona, and it, did a, it was only up at 20 feet. And that did a good job. It is. It, it does, does a great job. Okay. Anyone else? Felton, you've been quiet back there. The, the, the twin lead? Yeah, the twin lead or the uh, open ladder line. Is if it gets within that close of the metal, it's going to affect the function of the twin lead. Okay. Where are the cell standoffs? You know, if you make your own. <laughs> yeah, I never really liked one. I never liked one. I used to metal clothes more than you say a lot on the ground. Yeah. But sometimes that's the way it is. Well, there, there's, there's a a field set up between the two conductors in the twin lead and as you approach the width of that with metal it's going to disturb that field somehow. I've never seen anybody talk to that. So, but if you put the metal right to a section of it, say that much, I think it would appear quite different than 450 or whatever the whatever it is, that section is not going to be the, the impedance that you're looking for. And the other G5R question I have, I've heard it both ways. Is it also affected by the amount of coax you're feeding it with? <laughs> loss. The loss is, but. I've, I've heard it, you need to feed it with 100 feet of coax for it to match properly. If you want to do it without a tuner on certain frequency. There are ways of trying to do it without a tuner. I'd but once you start making changes on it up at 20 meters, for instance, it's, I, think it's, I think you're going to lose your tuning rather quickly when you're up yeah, there. Radiated? Okay. The best way to think about it is at every point where there is a mismatch, every point at which there is a mismatch in your antenna system, which means coming out of the radio, if you've got your tuner at your radio, it's matching whatever the tuner is seeing. Ideal place to have a tuner is at the antenna. And they do make remote tuners. Because coming out of that tuner, 50 ohms, coax all the way to the radio. MSK has a good one, which I, you could recommend. It's a lot better than your other product. <laughs> But it, that, that's a good question, but every place that you've got a mismatch, you're going to lose some. So why not have it out at the antenna and then have everything from there back to the radio uh, do a matchup? Because you could have 1.5 SWR, which 1.5 at the antenna is no biggie in my book. But that 1.5 at the tuner input, 
might be 2.5 or greater that's been diminished by the loss over your cable. Okay? You follow what I'm saying there? You could have a higher SWR at the antenna and what the tuner is doing is basically tuning the antenna cable and the antenna as a system, not the antenna. Yep. Depends on whether or not it gets out. I use 80 watts and I can almost always talk to Charles on Sunday. <laughs> That's a good question in terms of the antenna is the ideal place to have a tuner. I'll let you wrap up this antenna over here when we get ready to go. What's your philosophy on grounding? Grounding? What I practice and what I say for grounding are not the same. Uh, let's start, let's say you've got a tower. I don't care what kind of tower it is. What the book says and what I agree with based on my knowledge of that aspect of it, is you bond a ground cable to each leg. I didn't say clamp it, I said bond it. You take it to three rods in the ground, relative close, make gentle turns, because that becomes an inductor for lightning. Okay, so you want gentle turns. <clears throat> that's just the first start of grounding and, and we're talking about a tower and you can think in other aspects of what to do going into your house definitely have one a ground there with some sort of a, a rester there uh, but also out at the tower the recommendation is go out about 10 feet and put three more in the ground and that, that's, I agree with that. That's not what I practice. <laughs> and it's one of how temporary or how permanent is this installation. I get a tower up, that's what I will do. Uh, so th does that give you a sense of where I'm coming from? Yeah, is there anything you actually do to the antennas other than maybe you ground your coax? That's well, and that's, that's part of what you should do at the base of the antenna is basically come into a box a ground, ground plate there, uh, and then go through one of these, uh, what do they call them? I can't think of the name of them, but actually go through one of those there as well as going into the house. I, I can answer some of the grounding faults. For okay. Coming from Louisiana where lightning is, uh, <clears throat> you're not going to take a direct hit. I don't care how much you ground, <laughs> have good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to ground it. But as far away from the house, so to speak, as you can, and like you say, the uh, 10 feet, 12 feet, whatever you can, if, you, if lightning hits, you want it to go into the ground right there. Not necessarily if it hits, but part of it. Uh, uh, another thing is, um, where's my chain here? Uh, another what? thing is, have your coax come in at an angle. Lightning doesn't like to go around sharp corners. It's, it's going to peel off at that, at that angle. Uh, the, the, co the coax, but not the ground wire. The coax. So a few of these things you take into consideration. The best thing is to worry about your safety, keep an RF out of the house, and uh, good insurance. <laughs> uh, now, now, lightning that hits your neighbor's house is going to affect you. But I say a direct hit, there, there is nothing. There's no way. Yeah, the 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 the, the, the energy the, the energy and a direct hit is unbelievable. Yeah. The lightning protection system that's on houses. Test your knowledge on this. Is that to take a hit or is it to avoid the hit? How many take a hit? How many to avoid the hit? Oh <laughs> you must know me. <laughs> The lightning protection system on a house 
is the same thing that the major power substations have, those big spikes that go up. It's to bleed it off, bleed the charge off so that it doesn't hit. But if it does hit, it's got a good system to go to. But it is ba the, uh, the old lightning rods were intended to bleed it off. The charge around the area where you are. A lot of people don't, don't, are not aware of that. Chris, what was your question again? The question is about lightning. Well, we started out on lightning protection, right? Grounding. And grounding. And then the question came up about taking direct hits. Well, and, and I kind of added to that question from a standpoint, what is the purpose of lightning rods? And it's to bleed off the charge in that local area so that the hit will go someplace else. We can't afford the kind of system that does that. I'm not even sure how effective the old lightning uh, rods on houses were because you've, you've got to cover a large area to bleed that off. So. When your house is the tallest thing standing in the middle of a prairie, you're going to take more hit. <laughs> in, in, when your True. House is in the Georgia Pines. Yeah, I've got, I've, got, I've got trees within 100 yards of me, less than 100 yards of me, that are taller than my house. So. That oak tree across the street has saved me many, many times. <laughs> <I'll say that. laughs> I think there's been some, more than just that one that's probably yeah, saved you. Okay, does that, does that answer kind of where we were coming from on that? Absolutely. We had a fellow at a LJ one year, some years back, come and give a class on lightning and protection and so forth. Uh, Interesting thing was uh, lightning, you know, it, it looks like it's probably two, five feet wide, but it's only the size of a quarter. Let me tell you about a, let me tell you about a situation, <laughs> situation I ran into with a lightning protection system several years ago. We were installing uh, communication system at Hamilton Medical Center. And uh, HF was so noisy, we couldn't even copy Calhoun. And we were basically using kind of a semi-long wire that went up and it had to turn a corner and whatever. It was something that Andrews, I think, made for the military but it was so noisy. Come to find out, the lightning protection system is where the noise was coming from. Some of us were questioning, when was the last time this system's been checked? Telephone company had the same problem with their old lines and this lightning protection that had terminated at your house. <laughs> Carbon, uh, yeah, and the and the HF system at Hamilton Medical Center is still not operational. And they, they're at that location, it's not going to happen unless they do some major changing to the. Uh, you look at where the cable runs around with the spikes that are on top of the building; they're all bonded. Some of them might be corroded, but where do they go down? Oh, that's the rooftop drain. That's all I'm going to say. Oops. Who knows what kind of corrosion and little rectifiers we have <laughs> in that chain, chain to the ground. Getting them to fix it is going to be. But uh, we could, we could, we could take a AM radio. Used to have you know these little handheld AM radios. Mm -hmm. And we could go around the rooftop, and every time we got close to the lightning protection system, all kinds of noise. Some of it, some of my, some of it may have been generated within, with equipment inside. Some, some people even thought it was the 
elevator, which was one of the high spots over there. But it was always connected to the lightning protection. We had somebody come in from LJ. Somebody mentioned earlier that somebody yeah, grounded. Yeah. I think he may have been the guy that came over and took a look at it from, for, for us, not the hospital. And, and the other, bring it up to date, wall warts. There are a lot of wall warts that don't cause HF interference, especially yep. in your house. In your, from your lamp, get some of these lamps. Why is that Well, every LED has got a transformer in it. As, as well as a power supply. Uh, anything else? We've kind of gotten to weigh some peripheral stuff, but it's all part of part of radio. Felton, it's back to you.